subscribe to our youtube channel for in-depth interviews of india inc and press the bell icon so that you do not miss our updates Welcome to Nirmal Bang, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hilal Dadia. We have with us Mr. Krishnan Ankileshwar, Group CFO at uh, Polo Hospital Enterprises, joining in. Welcome to the show, Krishnan. And it's a pleasure to be speaking to you at such an unprecedented time as well, where a sector where you belong to is of utmost importance. Uh, firstly, let me understand clearly what has been the impact of COVID with regards to the sector, to regards the business because if you compare the transition between when it started in the last week of march to now how has the transition been no uh, thank you for having me on the show firstly you know, and uh, yes you know i agree to you that you know it has been very tough you know i think we are going through unprecedented times if you will i think you know we have been as as a hospital we have been there for 35 years now and we have obviously not seen something of this nature and this magnitude ever in the past. So when we started in March, of course, it was really scary because you know we didn't know the protocols, we didn't know how to handle patients, etc. Because uh -huh. obviously, while the doctors were had knowledge about it from what was being done elsewhere, you know the the proof of the pudding is obviously in eating, as they say, and in this case, treating. So clearly, what happened was. You know, from Q4, uh, when there was a lot of scare in Q1, I guess when the whole thing, uh, because of the uh, lockdown, we got significantly impacted across all industries, I guess, including hospitals. For hospitals, it's been a very tough time, right? Because, you know, we are on the forefront of the health, of the national narrative now, right? Clearly, we have a social obligation. We have a moral obligation to take care of our consumers. We have to also at the same time take care of our employees and our doctors, right? Because, you know, at, at one side, you know, while patients are very, very worried and they were, they wanted to get themselves treated, they didn't know where to go and they obviously wanted to go to the best hospitals. And clearly we were flooded with a lot of, uh, lot of uh, requirements of COVID in the first quarter of this year. But from then on, I guess, you know, we have seen that we have been able to create create a lot of beds. We have done almost one third over 2,000 oh, wow. 350 beds are now created in the Apollo ecosystem. Oh. And we have done significant number of bed creation. The doctor protocols have changed significantly. The treatment protocols have changed significantly. And happy to say that, you know, now we are seeing that at least of the number of patients who are now getting treated, oh. the mortality rates are less than 1%, even for the critical care cases who come to Apollo. So that's one good thing. But yeah, costs have gone up. Well. There is no doubt about it. You know, there are the costs have gone up in the system. You know, now there is a cost of, of, of ensuring that we roster our, our nurses in a particular manner. We have to do infection control. The infrastructure uh -huh. itself has to be made in a more manner that you have COVID and non-COVID, right? Because, you know, while COVID has, has, has hit the roof, you know, the fact is emergencies continue. The strokes continue. The heart attacks continue. Uh -huh. and we have the tertiary care setup. So we have to ensure that the protocol for a, for a non-COVID patient is separate from a COVID patient. You know, the pathway is different. You know, all these things mm. have added a burden on the overall system. Right. So, uh, Krishnan, with this, if you have to compare the first quarter of FI21 to the second quarter that we've already finished, and now we're already in the third quarter, how has the occupancy been from March to now? Because, yes, you know, there has been a major shift in this. There was occupancy with regards to where COVID-related patients were concerned. Secondly, when it came to elective surgeries, et cetera, that's something which were uh, getting postponed and delayed. And that's something which the doctors themselves were advising as well that, you know, if we can do with it, might as well postpone those. And thirdly, when it came to critical care as well, for those people were scared to really come, and that's why they probably themselves took a call that we don't really want to go to the hospital at this point in time. So taking this entire scenario into consideration, how has the occupancy transition been? So you're right, uh, Hiral. Obviously, you know we are as you know we are responsible. Uh, we are a very responsible healthcare system, 
and even the doctors obviously know that you know especially in q1 when there was a lot of peaking happening and of we, we let's hope that the peak is behind us as of mm. now hopefully you know we are seeing some drops in the overall cases of course not so much everywhere certain cases it's still peaking certain cases it seems to have peaked but then again there is a spurt but your point is well is correct that you know in q1 our occupancy came down all the way to 20 25% mm. in the first month of q1 and overall then it picked up a bit but for the first uh, quarter we reported 38% occupancy uh, typically you know we have 8000 beds 10000 beds is our overall capacity and you know we have 8000 operating beds in our in our hospital network uh, mm. 38% was our occupancy for first quarter from the 38% occupancy you know in the we have seen that month on month in the month of q in the, in the quarter of uh, second quarter we have definitely seen that there has been a uh, increase in the overall uh, number of occup occupancy and we have now seen that in in q2 the occupancy has been close to 50% so from a 38 we have seen 50% as we speak in october we are at almost around 60% occupancy uh, uh, so clearly i think um, it's it's been definitely better than q1 uh, learning to live with covid is something that we are definitely doing right because you know having uh, have you know we now have a of the covid beds 2350 beds of apollo have now been earmarked for covid alone you know i'm sure that's a large number of beds having uh, the system cope up for 2350 beds is not easy you know mark you know it's you have to do infection control you have to take care of uh, of of ensuring that you know nurses are are safe you know do the quarantine as required because if someone is exposed and if we feel that you know he's he's not, he's going to be out there getting the infection we have to quarantine them so definitely there has been an increase in cost by 10 to 12 percent uh, overall in the system but with that said you know uh, 80 percent of the 2350 beds now are occupied with covid the other uh, other non-covid beds are now over 50 percent occupied so one thing good is you know from a financial perspective you know given that i'm the cfo i need to also talk to you about finance you know clearly from a finance perspective you know we are now well above the break even point for ebitda you know so in in first quarter we had a uh, had losses in our healthcare services business of course as you know as apollo we have healthcare services and standalone pharmacies you know the standalone pharmacies business in first quarter was not impacted at all uh, in, because you know, obviously, pharmacy business continues as usual, and we, in fact, that 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 in some way helps us de-risk our P and L our balance sheet significantly. Because fifty percent of our revenues comes from pharmacy, uh, which is the standalone pharmacies. We have over three thousand eight hundred of them. So the healthcare services was a was a loss in the first quarter. We are well above break even in the second quarter as we speak, and as we move into third quarter, I think we will see significant increase in our revenues and EBITDA even into the third quarter because electives are coming back. You know, today I think electives and, and are coming are at 60 to 65% of our pre-COVID levels. Uh, doctors have, have now come back. You know, they are uh, cautiously taking care of our patients. So I guess it will come to the 80% levels by end of this quarter. Sorry, you're in. You're on mute. Sorry, and uh, Krishna, this is an interesting bit that we've spoken about, especially when we talk about COVID as well. I think initially, not all hospitals entertained COVID patients. Slowly, steadily, you know, you had different hospitals which moved into taking a decision to allot beds for COVID. Now, if you could just help me understand, we have around 2,380 beds, out of which 80% of the beds are for, you know, occupied with regards to COVID. Now, what is it that make, makes you take the decision to allot beds with regards to COVID? And from a longer term perspective, what percentage of the occupancy you as a hospital are ready to keep aside for COVID patients? No, very good question. You know, so pre COVID preparedness is a very, very difficult subject. You know, as much as, you know, consumers were really upset in Q1 when, when there were a lot of hospitals turned down patients, etc. You know, the responsibility for someone like us is to ensure that 
you know, we, we are prepared for A, the clinical outcomes, you know, which is very important, which means we need to have the right ICU set up, you know, mm. having a right, you know, we, are, we have never been, uh, we, have, we have never had in the past been prepared for such a big pandemic, right? Of course. So, but at the same time in the, in the last 90 days, we have now from almost around 500 beds that we started with, we have scaled it up to 2,380, as you said, mm. and we have the potential to take it higher also. The preparedness of the infrastructure, so there are three, four things that we need to take care of. One is the preparedness of the infrastructure itself, you know, which means, you know, having a separate isolated, isolated um, wing for the COVID and the, and the, and the other wing for the non-COVID. Again, it is highly possible that someone who comes in as non-COVID suddenly turns COVID once inside the hospital. Then you um, have to figure out how he's shifted to the COVID because, you know, if COVID would be within you, and it is when we keep testing you every day, suddenly it would turn positive. So, you know, you would have, we would have to then shift you to the next to the quarantine him and take uh, him to the isolation ward. So one is the preparedness of the infrastructure. Second uh, is, the, is, the, is the moral, uh, uh, you know, taking care of the patient, of the, of the, of the nurses and the paramedic well-being is very important for us. Because, you know, it's not easy for them at all, right? We have been giving them, you know, people don't know, you know, it's easy for people to ask why COVID costs so much, you know, or in fact, COVID is like any other medical treatment, right? It's not any different from that. So, you know, we have to, we have the cost of a PPE, we have the cost of infection control. And in addition, we have the cost of the nurses product, you know, we have to give them productivity incentives, risk allowances, you know, all of that is something because someone is risking his life for you. It's not easy. And, and those are the things which are the preparedness which have to be taken care of while we ramp up our beds. Today, I can tell you that if there is a requirement, we can definitely increase our beds by another 50%. You wow. know, uh, that is something that we can comfortably tell you as a polo. But uh, today, I, I don't think there is that kind of a requirement today. It's, it's, it is, you know, we are, we are doing it. You know, the, the important thing for you to understand is when we did the whole, uh, whole treatment for COVID, we addressed it in three different ways. One, we said, you know, we will do home quarantine and ensure that we do home treatment. We have a home division and a home care uh, subsidiary of ours. We have treated eight, eight, 7,000 patients uh, at home, you know, without bringing them to the hospital. So there, wow. is a, there is a digital way of doing it. We do a technologically, we have ensured that we have their take care of their diet. We do a testing if required. So that is 7,000 of them we have done at home. In addition, we had something called I stay. We tied up with large hotels like Ginger, yes. for example, with the Taj. And we have been able to, you know, we had large tie ups like banks like HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank, HSBC. All of them wanted their employees to be taken care of. And in a place like Bombay, as you're aware, you know, some of our some of us wouldn't have the ability to quarantine ourselves uh, perfectly because you have you're worried about your family members. So they go into the hotel setup and we were taking care of them in the hotels. So we have treated 6,000 patients just in the hotel setup in addition to the 7,000 at home. Uh -huh. We have done over 200,000 RT-PCR tests at our hospitals and our, and our setups so far. Of course, it's not like the diagnostics, but most of this 200,000 who have come to Apollo, you can be sure are being taken care of by our doctors also remotely. So that is the number of treat patients that we have treated and over 20,000 admissions and discharges of COVID alone until today. So clearly, you know, the, the, we have done a large number and uh, I guess we would be the largest uh, private uh, sector uh, mm -hmm. uh, treat, uh, treating COVID in this time. Right. And, you know, with this interesting fact that you've given us right now, uh, you know, you have you've taken three different approaches, Krishnan, with regards to treating. Now, how do the costs differ for all the three different treatments? So it is various. It's, it's, it's significantly different, right? So for the home quarantine, we have been doing, we have launched the home quarantine at something as simple as 799 rupees for, for, okay. uh, for, uh, for a 10-day you know, 10 day home quarantine where, you know, we take care of ensuring that, you know, we just, uh, uh, we, we, we keep them tested. We ensure that, you know, he, he, we do a digital uh, consult with them. We ensure that that patient is okay. 
you know that's a very simple home mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whereas when you do a hotel stay of course you have to take care of the hotel cost which is the i stay correct you know, it used to be around 5 to 6000 rupees a day for the patients who 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 were uh, using the i stay facility to quarantine themselves it would be probably you know 7 to 10 days depending on how long the disease is mm. in, in the in of course when you come to the apollo hospital setup you know most of these patients are sick right we don't typically we have never brought in a patient who doesn't require treatment at apollo mm-hmm. so our, our thing has been that we responsibly take care of only those patients who really need the hospital setup which means we know that you have breathing difficulty you have fever you have comorbidities you know probably your spo2 or your oxygenation mm-hmm. levels are lower than 80 you know so those are the patients who come into apollo and that you know the average length of stay could be around 7 to 10 days but even there i think you know overall the cost has been well within you know i think it ranges between 1 and 1/2 lakhs to 2 lakhs right and I, with this another aspect was on the operational front the cost that did increase for hospitals now yes there has been a lot of to and fro a lot of debate that happened as to you know why is it that hosp- private hospital costs are increasing and why is it that they are charging patients versus that's not happening with government hospitals but i'm sure the situation is really different from a private hospital to a government hospital uh, with regards to sanitizing premises getting protective gears for the healthcare staff by how much have the operational costs gone up for a hospital like yours so here oh, yeah. is the issue unfortunately the narrative out there in the media has always been very anti private hospitals uh-huh. i don't know why you know see i'll tell you honestly people have still not understood the private hospital uh, you know cost setup you know we are not just about doctors and pharmacy you know we are a lot about services you know people don't understand the services cost of the hospitals that is significantly higher you know so to give you a perspective you know for one bed you know uh, every hospital that we have we have six employees per bed which means if you are talking talking of a 300 bedded uh, hospital that you have you know we are talking of almost around 2000 employees who are taking care of that 300 bedded hospital anywhere in bombay for example unlike you know even if you look at a five star hotel you know a 300 bedded five star hotel will not require over 455 uh-huh. people so it's a highly intense service oriented business on top of that you know you have so much of cost you know be it the housekeeping cost the infection control cost you know the cost of uh, um, uh, cost of sanitation there is a cost of doctor in addition to the 6 and 7 beds that the 6 and 7 employee uh-huh. for bed that we have pharmaceutical so all of that adds up to, and and uh, diagnostics don't come cheap in india right we don't be we import all our diagnostic equipments you know be it from philips or ge or whatever so cost of running a private hospital is very very uh-huh. very high you know and Uh, the treatment costs are going to be higher as well because of that you know it's not something that's you know and if you look at our balance sheet it's there in public domain mm-hmm. all of us are listed companies you can see a return on investments not that we are making return on investments which are you know significantly high like some of even the even the consumer companies and fmcg companies in india you know our return on investments are normal it is probably between our our our, our 12 to 14% you know which is the normal returns that we need to make as hospitals to ensure that our debt is serviced our stakeholders are taken care of our investors are taken care of you know there is never an element of profiteering at all yeah it's those one or bell bills which you know become significantly higher because of comorbidities etc yeah. it gets flagged out by the media and i guess you know i don't have much to say about that you know it's it's a right. fact that it's not being understood properly right so krishan you know the government's decision to clamp down on prices and force hospitals to reserve beds for covid has also hit the bottom line for a lot of hospitals could you quantify the same for us for apollo so what we have done for our side you know we ensure that we take only the critical care patients right so mm-hmm. yeah certain it's not that of course our health is a state subject which means you know it is it is every state decides on how to run the hospital or the healthcare system of theirs so maharashtra government will take care of maharashtra tamil nadu government will take care of tamil nadu a delhi government will take care of delhi etc there have been certain states where there have been clamp down there are certain states where there have not been clamp down wherever there have been a clamp down of course we have ensured that we will still serve our patients there 
but mm. we are making losses you know i should admit that in those cases you know we are making losses but you know I, if, given that you know we uh, there has been an assurance from the states themselves that you know it is just a, just for a brief period of time that they are they are they are they are enacting this you know we have gone with the flow and accepted that and admitted those patients as well but from our case uh, from our perspective yes you know some of these are a bit difficult because you know you can't have a see you can't have a one size fits all in healthcare at all right. how covid impacts a patient a and how covid impacts a patient b and a patient c is different hmm. patient a the cost of covid treatment at the polo could be 1 lakh patient b could go all the way to 3 4 lakhs but patient c if he goes into the icu setup doesn't come out you know there have been mila you know people don't understand you know out of the 20000 cases you know there have been at least i can tell you case studies of at least 100 of them who would have lost their lives had not they uh, come into the apollo icus for care you know so that's a significant number of 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 cases and these have all pe- been people who have been there for 20 25 days and the doctors have been have been have been really uh, struggling to ensure that they are they they get their lives back those people know the cost of their life you know those people understand what it is and they are very happy paying you know uh, because when when it comes to you that's when you realize that you know that that life cannot really be priced you know it right. is priceless as we say right so with this do you think that the government needs to actually go ahead and increase their spends on healthcare in india and if yes what should be the apt amount because what's happening right now is yes there are people who have you know medical insurance however the ones who don't who can't afford it what happens because then it becomes a it's, it's a very debatable question over here as to our lives not important uh, for the government of our country then taking this into consideration do you think there should be some precedence that the government should take of this situation and do something where the spends increase where a lot of support is given uh, to healthcare infrastructure no i completely agree with you i think you know one thing that uh, hiral we need to definitely do which we have been also been telling the government uh, is first is we have to ensure that we make health insurance compulsory or mandatory for all the employees or employers you know just like a provident fund you know uh, where you know that pf is mandatory we have we have to make that is taking care of your social security beyond 60 but mm. at the same time you should also make health insurance mandatory and by health insurance you can take care of health insurance of your families you know uh, i think that's the first stage that you know if you are able to do that it's a good thing so what happens by that is people start getting uh, aware of the importance of health insurance there are fabulous health insurance companies in india now right you look at it you know of course apollo munich was there and now apollo munich has been taken over by hdfc ergo hdfc ergo icic lombard bajaj alliance we have large health insurance companies now and all of them are fairly capable of 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 significantly scaling up on health insurance itself so i think first level health insurance at the private level is important not that health insurance is expensive at all let me assure you that your health insurance is probably one fifth the cost or at least one third the cost of your vehicle insurance um, you know correct. all of our ensure that you know we take care of our vehicle insurance is mandatory in india but uh-huh. health insurance unfortunately is not so i guess insurance is very important at the first level second level yeah from the government perspective you are right you know they have already said that they are going to be increasing they are at 1.2% of gdp and they have said that they would want to take it to 2.5% of gdp the government spend uh-huh. itself but the important thing is the effectiveness of the government spend and the important thing is to ensure that the government hospitals are run well and uh, you maybe through ppp models or whatever that is so that you know some of the private sector hospitals like us can participate in operating or running them Uh, without uh, the government really worried about some of the operations of those hospitals if you will but correct. secondly the effectiveness is important but again 2.5% is it sufficient for a country of india size answer is no you know we probably require 5% of the gdp to be spent uh, on healthcare uh, hopefully eventually we will find some budgets for that the government has to figure out a way to allocate the budgets for that what they should do is as they are doing the aishman bharat scheme which uh-huh. is definitely a good start they should cover the 50% of the indian population which they are 
the uh. other fifty percent, I guess, they should be allowed to be taken care of through private insurance, so that you know the fifty percent where the government covers, they get the right and appropriate cover. You know, uh. today they say that they cover they, they cover you up to five lakh rupees, but what happens on the back is you know the compensations that they are giving to hospitals such as us is definitely not sufficient to cover our costs in it. Uh, you know clearly you know we can't be uh, you know we are a private sector hospital we have other stakeholders and investors including global investors whom we are accountable to we require to obviously give that amount of returns for sustainable business right not about correct correct you know, unless i don't sustain my business i can't grow and take care of the vast majority of indian population for that there should be a sustainable return even if it is a, a like a like a power project you say that uh, you know, Give me at least a fourteen percent return. You know, even a power project gets that kind of a return. So okay. I guess you have to get into a pricing on the Ayushman Bharat, which is a bit more feasible for some of the uh, hospitals like us. Right, and and you know that's an important point that you've made. And with all of this, what happens with Apollo is that you have seen some bit of diversification in your business. do you think diversification actually helped your business remain resilient in these current times and if you have to you know think of what's going to be the growth driver for the next probably 12 to 18 months which segment of business would it be so very good question you know we are significantly diversified and we see right from day one you know when chairman envisaged about apollo and way he thought about apollo he always thought about it as as a network of hospitals you know even when we had one hospital it was called apollo hospitals enterprise limited that was the first hospital that he set up from there we have become a healthcare network when we say healthcare network you know we have started you know we started with hospitals we then moved on to do clinics uh, we are now the largest uh, retail pharmacy operator out of india right we have 3800 stores and you know this year we should be over roughly around 6000 crores of our revenues uh, will come only from stand alone pharmacies you know the uh, which is going to be at least at 50% of our overall hospital revenues it's also uh, overall consolidated revenues which means you know assuming that we are a 10 12000 crore revenue business almost 50% now comes from stand alone pharmacies so we are now you know we have uh, we have a subsidiary called apollo health and lifestyle where the whole perspective is to come closer to the consumer when we are saying we have to go closer to the consumer we are saying okay let the hospitals do what it has to do the consumer will come to the hospitals for its need of cardiac orthopedics neuro we are a tertiary care setup right 60% of our revenues comes from high end tertiary care business as you call it uh, is the you know like the cardiac orthopedics uh, neuro strokes oncology etc whereas on the primary and the secondary care we want to come closer to the consumer which is why we started something called apollo health and lifestyle where we have the cradles business which is the boutique birthing center and the women and child where we have uh, almost around 9 cradles now uh, we are growing that business we have the apollo spectra which is about day care or day surgery centers you know we have two day surgery centers in in bombay one in chembur and another in tardev mm. we have similarly in other locations as well so the day surgery centers is about saying we will take care of the minimally invasive secondary care work in the day uh, surgery setup you don't have to come into the hospital you just come here get yourself treated go back home the next day or in the same day itself you know so that is the day surgery setup then we are increasing the diagnostics so we are on multi we are also started home care which i told you that we have treated 7000 patients of covid in the home uh, care setup itself so we are a network the three main business drivers that i will look at for apollo one is the hospitals business will still continue to grow 12 to 14% with time we, we will become a 10000 crore hospital company very shortly the, hosp, the the stand alone pharmacies business with the 6000 crores will also potentially get to 10000 crores in the next four years by 2025 the stand alone pharmacy business will also become a 10000 crore business because we are growing that by almost 20% and that will continue to grow uh, at that at that level for the next 3 4 years of course the most important thing is now we have added apollo 247 right apollo 247 has been a very recent launch where we have now decided that we are going to be significantly pivoting around digital healthcare 
using our pharmacies as a base also right mm. when we are doing digital healthcare it's not just online pharmacy we are saying that we will do online and offline pharmacy using apollo 24/7 offline mm. is already mm. there and india will always be an omni channel market it won't be a completely online market it wouldn't remain an offline market it would be an omni channel market so apollo 24/7 will make us omni channel on pharmacy apollo 24/7 you know mm. we in fact you know not many know that over the last 6 months we started apollo 24/7 we have over 3.2 million uh, registered users now in apollo 24/7 it and it mm. is one of the fastest a uh, growing app today in india on on healthcare so what we have done through apollo 247 now is once you register yourself in apollo 247 we mm. ensure that you can do your digital consults which today we are doing almost 2800 uh, tele consults every day using your mobile so you can just choose your doctor of your choice and he will be there and he will be able to do a digital consult you know eventually you know some of this will become ai enabled etc but that mm. is with time today you know the whole perspective is to see how this 3.2 million users with time becomes 10 million 50 million and 100 million you know our 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 vision is to take it to 100 million in the next 5 years uh, just on the number of users on 247 apollo 247 such that apollo 247 in addition to the hospitals and the mm. services becomes a very important segment for us uh, you know to take care of the of the evolving patient needs that's the way that we are thinking of this business of course apollo health and lifestyle along with diagnostics is again will become an important area for growth right so overall you know with this growth plan into perspective with this expansion that we could be looking at now healthcare as a sector as well has seen a sharp spike with regards to where technology adoption goes both businesses have also adopted it and consumers have also learned how to adapt to it what has your experience been with regards to where uh, on the technological front and with that do you think costs have increased or costs do you see costs decreasing with the use of technology a very good one. first point you know embracement of technology you know we have always been at the forefront of embracing technology even before digital right mm-hmm. the way i would look at technology we look at apollo as three levels of technology one oh. is the medical technology second is just the it or the it backbone and third is the digital so if you look at the medical technology itself you know apollo west was one of the earliest or the first to bring in mris into india when mris was not even there in india that was around you know we we can't imagine of the situation today because oh. you know every nook and corner today probably has an mri machine but right from being the first and then we 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 brought in some of the best uh, uh, machines for cancer you know then we brought in something called you know robotics so we have almost four ro- six robotics now six robots in in our hospitals wow. and robotics is is of course all of this comes at the cost the your, your point is you know for example a robo costs almost around uh, 2 million dollars so mm. it's not significant it's a significant cost to take care of a robo but what it does for the patient is the efficacy for the pre- pre- patient is significantly better so what happens is the patient is for if, if the if the recovery rate for the patient under the normal procedure is say 20 days this will bring it down to probably around 6 days you know so clearly there is a significant re- faster recovery lesser blood loss you know uh, it's it's much superior for the patient of course the cost of surgery does go up right because you know the robotic cost is an additional cost correct anything of quality will cost us we have to accept that you know quality comes at a cost you know quality doesn't come cheap and uh-huh. clearly when we are when we are moving towards some of this quality we have to be ready to do that 25% additional cost if required you know it's not going to be we wouldn't introduce anything in india which is going to be significantly costly uh-huh. but Twenty five percent is something that the consumer is willing to pay because he sees the benefit of it for himself, and we also bring in only that which is beneficial for him. So that medical technology is something we have we have brought in the, the proton therapy, which is the which is the best for oncology treatment, and we are the first proton therapy uh, uh, we in in this Southeast Asia. You know, there is no uh-huh. proton therapy in Southeast Asia other than uh-huh. Apollo today. The next proton therapy for treatment of oncology. 
oncology or cancer is going to come in Tata Memorial maybe in the next couple of years. But we brought that, you know, it's not a small machine. You know, the machine and the project cost us 1,000 crores. You know, right. to put 1,000 crore cost is not easy. And then after that, you have to recover that. You know, obviously, there is a price that some of the patients have to pay. People who are willing to pay will pay for it. People Correct. who can't afford for it will obviously have to take care of, of some of the other options which are available. But right. that's in the medical technology. IT, again, we have a strong backbone which we have built over the last few years. And now we are pivoting into digital using Apollo 24 7. Right. So, with all of this, very lastly, taking all the expansion plans into consideration, taking the current situation into consideration, Krishna, do you think there will be a requirement of fund infusion? And if yes, are we looking at any fundraising right now? Good point. So, you know, we are from a, from a balance sheet perspective, if you pretty much look at it, we are quite comfortable. You know, we are over, uh -huh. you know, over 3,000 plus crores of debt broadly. Right. 3,200 crores of debt, gross debt. That is what we have currently. And, uh, you know, if the debt EBITDA would be, uh, you know, if you look at next year, you know, of course, FI20 is a, 21 is a COVID year. We can't look at the EBITDA for this year, but hopefully by, we are ramping up and we'll come back to pre-COVID EBITDA, hopefully by Q1, or, or at least close to pre-COVID EBITDAs by Q1 of next year. But given that, you know, we would see that, uh, the, you know, the debt EBITDA would be a comfortable two, two and a half uh, to, a, you know, debt to the EBITDA number would be very comfortable. So we really don't need much capital from that perspective. But of course, with COVID, you know, we also have opportunities to do certain bolt-on acquisitions. You know, for example, as we speak, you know, there is an opportunity for us to, uh, to, to buy 50% of our partner's stake in Calcutta. You know, so uh, that's one opportunity that is coming our way. There are opportunities, select opportunities in select markets, which is, uh, which, you know, obviously there are certain assets of healthcare, which now needs to be preserved from India's perspective, right? Because certain people are going to be finding it difficult to run their operations. So if you look at capital, uh, at, at, at asset preservation as being one of the important areas that, that India will have to work on and healthcare providers like us will have to look at, I guess we have to look at a bit of opportunities here and there. So it does present us uh, present us with some opportunity of capital expansion, but presently we are evaluating. We have not yet decided about it on how we would want to take some of this. From our perspective, you know, most of our bulk of our expansion plans are behind us. We don't see significant expansion required because over 3,000 beds today are new in our system. Of the 10,000 beds that we have, 2,500 beds are new. And clearly all of that will start maturing over the next five years which means that the hospital revenues can grow at the 12 to 14%, as we said, with significant EBITDA expansion. So to answer your point, organically, we have a lot of headroom. Inorganically, if there are opportunities, we can look at some of that. Mm -hmm. That's the way that we of course, the decision of capital raise will be more decided by the board. Correct. Absolutely. And I think everyone's going to be looking forward to as well with the growth aspect. Thank you, Krishnan, so much for joining us on the show. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Great insights that we've picked up with regards to business industry, as well as in terms of how COVID is being treated right now as well. It was a pleasure speaking to you. I hope you enjoyed the discussion as well. And we hope to see you back soon again. Stay safe. Thank you so much, Hidal. Pleasure talking to you and stay safe, everyone. Thank uh...